So I want to talk about my view of big data, uh, especially about disruption, meaning what's, going to, what's likely to change that's going to impact your lives in a big way, and then what you should really be worried about, which is the gorilla in the corner. So what is big data all about? Well, most everybody classifies it these days as you've got a big data problem if you've got too much of it and you're having a tough time getting your hands around it. Uh, and lots of people are worried about you know, s you know, doing SQL style analytics that I'll, on big data, which I'll call simple analytics. Uh, increasingly, uh, people are worried about complex analytics on big data, so I'll talk about both of those. Uh, other people say that they have a big data problem if it's coming at you too fast and you have a tough time keeping up. So drinking from a fire hose uh, is often described as a big data problem. And then you have a big data problem if you have a, if you have a variety problem, which is uh, the data is coming from too many different places and you have a tough time uh, integrating it. So I'll talk about all three. So in terms of little analytics on big data, SQL analytics on big data. That's well addressed by the data warehouse crowd. Uh, I know of about 20 petascale data warehouses running on a variety of vendors' uh, software. And these guys are pretty good at SQL analytics on hundreds of nodes, petabytes of data. I declare that solved. Go, go get it from a commercial vendor, and there are a bunch of them that are okay at doing this. Everybody who counts is running multi-node, part, you know, partitioned, parallel column stores. If you don't know what that is, all the major vendors are doing that. The only guy who isn't is Oracle, and uh, Oracle Marketing claims they're a column store, but they're not really. Uh, my favorite joke about Oracle is you want to know on what platform Oracle runs the best. Anyone have a guess? Exadata. That must be the Oracle speaker. <laughs> <laughs> runs, the, uh, runs the best on a 35 millimeter slide projector. <laughs> okay, so I'll promise to be more serious. <laughs> Okay, what's the fly in the ointment to the, to the data warehouse crowd? Uh, the answer is the cloud, the public cloud. You, you guys are all gonna move everything there sooner or later. Uh, in the next, it may take you a decade, it may take you more time, but we're all gonna move all our data there. And why are we gonna do that? Well, I'll just give you one quick vignette. Uh, from Dave DeWitt, who until uh, recently was the uh, head of the uh, uh, Microsoft Jim Gray Systems Lab. So you want to know what uh, Azure data centers look like. They turn out to be shipping containers in parking lots, power in, cold water in, internet in, otherwise sealed. Uh, roof and walls are optional. They're only there if you need them for security. And uh, if you have raised flooring data centers in Boston, you are obviously not going to compete against uh, the likes of Azure. Uh, they are putting up data centers as fast as they can. Uh, they're running millions of nodes. You're running hundreds or thousands. Uh, you can't compete. So everybody's going to move there. And the darn trouble is, is that the cloud vendors all play by different rules. So uh, in AWS, just for example, you are highly encouraged to use S3, which is not a partition store. So you're, you're encouraged to use it by their pricing algorithms. They have a dramatic pricing advantage to their in-house systems that is not applied to uh, the uh, systems that come from elsewhere. And what's hardest is that when you run on, on AWS, you have to choose what's called a t-shirt size. 
And there are more than 50 of them, which is bundles of computing, storage, networking. So it behooves you to get smart on any vendor's offerings because the price you will pay will vary dramatically. And so cloud architecture, you know, how, how you structure bundles, what database system you use, uh, how you avoid turning over the gross national product to Amazon, uh, all of this is a challenge. So you'll have to get smart. However, this is simply a local issue that you'll have to deal with. Uh, the bigger issue is that warehouses are yesterday's problem. Uh, why is that? Uh, you guys are all going to move to doing what's called data science. It's going to supersede business intelligence as soon as you can get uh, enough competent data scientists to do data science as opposed to business intelligence. So after all, would you rather have a predictive model uh, that tells you what, what you'd like to know or a big table of numbers for you to try and figure out what you want to know? So data science will take over, and it, it, it is very different stuff. It does not look like SQL. So data science is, well, it means whatever your marketing department comes up with, really. But technically what it means is either non-SQL data analytics, so something like principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, all that stuff. So that's what data science is. Or it means machine learning. Machine learning comes in two flavors, uh, what's called deep learning and ordinary machine learning. I'll talk about both. So data science is in your future. If, it, if you aren't already worried about it, you should start worrying about it. So at the end of the day, whether you're doing machine learning or whether you're doing uh, other non-SQL analytics. All of this stuff is linear algebra on big tables of stuff. So it does not look like tables and it has nothing to do with SQL. So, so far this has been the world of the quants and the rocket scientists. Uh, you will need to hire at least a couple of these people to help explain to you uh, which algorithms to use because things like error analysis and uh, the rate at which they run varies a lot. So anyway, this is in your future and it does not look like SQL. So all the stuff you're going to use has a few inner loops. You open up machine learning and underneath machine learning is matrix multiply. So at the end of the day, you're trying to run matrix multiply or similar kinds of low-level linear algebra on big tables of stuff. So don't think of this as a SQL problem. This is not a SQL problem. Now, right now, deep learning has taken over all the oxygen in the room. Uh, why is that? Well, it's all the rage today. Uh, as say Google shows you that they can find pictures of, of kittens on the on the you know, in their stuff. So it's very good at image understanding. It's very good at machine translation, natural language processing. However, it is not going to take over the world. Why is that? Well, part time I work for Tamer, which you'll hear a little bit about later on. So they do machine learning. They have a whole bunch of customers who are doing data integration. Their customers have no interest in deep learning. None. Zero. Why is that? Well, first of all, getting training data in the enterprise is a huge, huge problem. And machine learning requires training data. Deep learning requires a lot of training data. And if you're having trouble getting training data, don't even think about machine learning. Second thing about deep learning is it's this black box. And you, and you say, well, why did you give me a credit score of only 710? Well, the data scientist points to this box and says, well, I don't know. <laughs> so it is not explainable. Now, maybe it will be one day, but it is not now. 
So if you need to explain to your customers why you did something, don't even think about deep learning. <coughs> so anyway, uh, it exists. Uh, Amadeus, for example, I listened to a talk. They did a machine learning system based on deep learning. Another one doing the same problem based on conventional ML. And the deep learning one worked slightly better. But they chose the conventional one because it was more explainable. So think about explainability when you think about how to do machine learning. So if you want to do ML, you know, if you want to do conventional ML, go get scikit-learn. Uh, if you want to do deep learning, go, go get TensorFlow. Uh, those are the popular packages. You are not going to code ML algorithms. You're going to use packages. And so uh, get familiar with the higher level packages and uh, expect there to be a lot of custom hardware to make this stuff go fast. Uh, Google has a thing called, you all know about GPUs. They have a thing called TP, TPUs, which are intended to make TensorFlow go fast. All of this stuff has no data management and no persistence. So the big problem you're going to face is if you're doing ML, the way it all works in either of these uh, methodologies, you bring up a model, you try it, it doesn't work. You tweak the parameters, it still doesn't work. You tweak the parameters some more, it still doesn't work. You change to some different algorithm, it still doesn't work. You say, oh crap, I want to back up to the first model and try again. So you require model management and, and management of the data for those models in order to be able to debug your machine learning. So data management and persistence is going to be a big problem, not currently addressed by the ML folks. OK, if you're doing non-ML and you're, you're trying to do principal component analysis or SVDs or other stuff like that, well, you can run one of the stat packages. They all have uh, these algorithms in them. The problem with the stat packages is there's weak or non-existent data management. So for instance, R runs on main memory data. It falls off a cliff if you need to do bigger data sets than will fit in main memory. So you can run a stat package, and that will work great on small data. But beware, if you someday need to go to big data, you're going to fall off a cliff. You can run an array database system. I said all of this stuff is array oriented. It has nothing to do with tables. So my point of view is, well, run the right technology underneath you. That's probably going to work the best. And so there's a bunch of startups who are doing array data management. Check them out. They're starting to get traction in the genomic space, which is an obvious array problem. So take a look at the array database systems. They're all from startups. Uh, you can run Spark. Uh, you can run your non-SQL data analytics on Spark. Uh, it's going to be slow. I'll, and the reason why is it can be beaten by almost anything else by a lot. So yes, it's the lowest common denominator, but it's not going to give you very high performance. Uh, I want to talk for a minute about Hadoop. Now, what I mean by Hadoop is I mean the map open source map reduce lookalike, the thing that has map and reduce in it. So that's what I mean by Hadoop. That was the original definition. Yahoo wrote Hadoop, an open source package doing a map operation, a reduce operation. That was a lookalike to MapReduce, which Google built. So by Hadoop, I mean that thing. Now, Hadoop has been morphed by the commercial vendors to mean all kinds of different things. So I, but I mean the original definition. So MapReduce is a complete joke in this space. Do not use MapReduce under penalty of death. <laughs> it is not competitive at anything. Now, Hadoop now means HDFS, which is 
And, and HDFS is a file system. I have no problem with HDFS, except it's not very fast. Against S3, it's not very competitive. So on the cloud, you're not, you know, don't, don't bother. So what's happened is MapReduce, uh, Cloudera originally came into existence to sell Hadoop, MapReduce. They figured out early on that MapReduce wasn't good at anything. So you're now a commercial company and you're peddling something that's no good. So what do you do? Well, why you turn your marketing department loose and they redefine Hadoop to mean something completely different. So Hadoop now means a complete stack, which is HDFS at the bottom and all kinds of stuff above it. So basically, you're, you're, you're going to move to HDFS. It's a file system. I have no big problem with HDFS, except other file systems, other d distributed file systems are better. Uh, and the marketing has moved toward uh, selling HDFS as a platform for data lakes. I'll talk about that in a bit. Now, Google abandoned MapReduce. Uh, MapReduce was originally written as the software to run their crawl to support uh, you know, their internet search. They abandoned Hadoop for the application for which it was custom built. So MapReduce was custom built to run the Google crawl. And they decided in 2012, I think, or so, that uh, MapReduce was no good at that application, and they moved it to Bigtable. So Google abandoned MapReduce on the search application for which it was custom designed. And a few years ago, they said, MapReduce has no place in our software stack whatsoever. So please don't run MapReduce. Run the other stuff if you want. OK, so that's the end of uh, big, big volumes. Let's talk about big velocity. The thing I want you to realize about big volume is that if you have a warehouse problem, I consider it solved. If you have a non-SQL big data analytics problem, there are lots of solutions. This is an, you know, an incipient market. Get smart at it. And uh, expect the Wild West uh, in terms of commercial products. OK, big velocity. So big velocity is starting to be a big problem. Uh, why? Well you are going to sensor tag everything of value. And so IoT, what, you know, as, it, as it's come to be called, uh, is going to send velocity through the roof. So my favorite example is car insurance. All the, all the car guys are going to ask you to uh, have a gizmo in your car that's going to watch how you drive 60 times a second or so, or at some fairly high rate. And the reason it's high rate is they want, to figure, they want to tell if you slam on the brakes or punch the accelerator and because they consider that unsafe driving. So they're trying to de determine how good a driver you are and base your rates on that. Uh, what's going to happen over time, for sure, is that uh, for those of you who live in Boston, this is a safe neighborhood. If you go two miles to the south, it's not so safe. So uh, how safe the neighborhood is is going to det determine how likely your car is to get, get uh, keyed by somebody or stolen. So rates at some point are going to depend on where you drive. And the gizmo can, can figure that out. So all of this is going to send velocity through the roof. Uh, people worry about you know, tagging ducks as they walk around in the marsh. Uh, that's a fun application, but that isn't the real application. It's going to be insurance and other things like that. MIT, where I work, is going to tag every parking space so that they can tell you where to park. They're going to, the, the buildings and grounds folks are going to walk around and drop sensor tags into pavement that needs repairs or benches that are broken. So we're going to just sensor tag everything. Uh, and certainly, smartphones are going to send velocity through the roof. 
Uh, so far, smartphones, are, are, they're starting to be used for everything. I mean, they, they are pretty much going to replace your PC at everything. So that will send velocity through the, through the roof. And multiplayer internet games that kids play, uh, I don't know why they do that, but World of Warcraft, very popular. And that's required, you know, you have to keep track of the state of the game. Anyway, there are all kinds of applications that are sending velocity through the roof. In terms of commercial products, there's two big classes of them. The first one I'll call big pattern, little state. The second one is little pattern, big state. So big pattern, little state is, is epitomized by electronic trading. So you're watching CNBC go across the screen uh, on your TV. So uh, there are lots, all of Wall Street has systems that are watching every trade and in fact, every bid and every, every ask. And they are looking for patterns in this fire hose of stuff. And you can think of this abstractly as find me a strawberry followed within 100 milliseconds by a vanilla. Uh, you know, find me a trade from IBM that is an uptick followed within 100 milliseconds by a trade of Oracle that's a downtick. And if I'm an electronic trader, then I take some action based on that, sell one, buy the other. So there's complex event processing systems that are focused on doing exactly this. And they work reasonably well. You can get them from a bunch of vendors. And at the present time, I don't know of anybody who's complaining that CEP cannot keep up with the, vo the velocity of their problem. Now that may change, but so far, uh, so far I don't hear anybody uh, tearing their hair out who's got this problem. The other solution class is I've got a lot of state, and I just need to keep track of it at very high uh, volume and at high performance. So, for instance, uh, the electronic trading company. Uh, whose name I shouldn't mention, uh, has electronic trading systems all over the world. Think Tokyo, New York, London, et cetera, et cetera. And they are doing electronic trading of the sort that I've just talked about. And the CEO has a problem. If all of their electronic uh, trading systems all decide to short IBM at the same time, that will entail too much risk. So they, they want to be able to have, you know, a ring the red telephone if risk is too high. So what that requires is for them to assemble the global state of all of their electronic trading systems all over the world for and or against every security that's being traded, which is order 60,000. So they want to keep this in real time, meaning one millisecond granularity. And so you say, OK, uh, and the, why do they want this? They just want to alert the CEO if their exposure to any particular stock is greater than a certain amount. So very real application being run today by, by multi-geography -ge electronic trading systems. So what does this look like? Well, this looks like very high performance OLTP. Why do I say that? Well, if you miss a message, you're screwed. You lose your, you lose your state. Uh, if you crash, then this, then this thing is of no value. So this has to stay up all the time. Can't miss anything. So basically, never lose my data and make sure you keep up. Sounds a lot like uh, OLTP at one mil millisecond granularity. So how do, you, how do you update this global database at very high speed? Well, you could run Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server or dot, dot, dot. So you can run the elephants. They, they're good at OLTP. This is an OLTP problem. Uh, you could run one of 75 or so NoSQL systems. 
And all of these vendors uh, so far are focused on giving up SQL and giving up transactions in order to go fast. Or you can run uh, what uh, a subset called New SQL, uh, who believe in retaining SQL, retaining ACID, but going fast with a completely different architecture than the elephants. Okay, so what about old SQL? It's just too slow. Don't even think about it. So what about no SQL? Well, this is an acid problem. You know, don't think about any solution that doesn't support real transactions. And so acid and SQL are really good ideas. What's more, these 75 vendors, there's no standards. They have 75 different, uh, different user interfaces. Without standards, it's really hard to get anywhere. Uh, what about new SQL? Well, this is all main memory database systems supporting SQL, supporting high availability, supporting transactions, but with different concurrency control than used by old SQL. And a variety of these vendors will be happy to do a million transactions a second on, on a multi-node main memory database system. So put a lot of hardware behind a main memory database system and you can do a million transactions a second. So far, I haven't heard of anybody who wants to go faster than that. So there's no gorilla here, at least not yet. Uh, and I expect the new SQL engines to keep up with whatever your problem is. So maybe that will change, but so far, I don't see any gorilla here. So run one, if you want to go fast, and you have something that looks like OLTP, run one of the new SQL guys. If you want to do CEP on, uh, you know, to support looking for patterns, run a CEP system. Uh, these guys can all keep up. So where is the 800-pound gorilla if it's not in velocity and it's not in volume? The answer is it's in big variety. So this is the 800-pound gorilla in the corner. And I'm going to give you two vignettes that tell you why this is the case. So the first one is we'll talk about data scientists for a minute. So the chief data officer of Merck, which has a location like down the street, uh, has you know, hundreds of, of data scientists. And what do they do? Well, they have an idea. They want to explore something. In the case of Merck, you know, maybe does row gain cause weight gain in mice? So they have a hypothesis and they want to test the hypothesis. So he or she, the data scientist, must find the relevant data that's relevant to his, his or her hypothesis. And that can come from 4,000 or so uh, Oracle databases inside Merck. Uh, or it can come from a big data lake that Merck runs, or it can come from the public, data, public uh, web. And so you've got to find, you've got a data discovery problem to find what you need to, what, what data sets are relevant. And then you have to perform data integration. So it turns out that the CDO, Mark Schreiber of Merck, says my people spend 95% of their time doing data discovery and data integration. 5% on the job, data science job for which they were hired. So basically think about 38 hours a week doing other stuff, two hours a week doing data science. So what should you worry about? Obviously, don't worry about the data science. Worry about what your people are spending all their time doing. Another vignette from, the, from a data scientist at iRobot. They're sort of 20 miles up the road north of here. And they, they build the vacuum cleaners that run around your living room automatically. Also, they've moved into doing lawn mowers that mow your lawn automatically. So here's her quote. I spend 90% of my time finding and cleaning the data that I'm interested in. So 90%. 
leaving me 10% to do the work I was hired for. And then I spend 90% of the remaining 10% checking and fixing the data cleaning that I've been doing because my models don't work. So she spends 99% of her time doing data integration, data cleaning, and data discovery. So put that one, tattoo that on your brain when you decide how you're going to spend your resources. And the key thing is you can't analyze dirty data. If you, have, if you write models of, of any sort and they're running on dirty data, they will produce garbage. And so garbage in, garbage out. You've got to clean your data. You've got to dis discover it, clean it, and integrate it. And without doing that, you're toast. Well, the same problem of, of data integration, data cleaning exists in the enterprise. Uh, General Electric, believe it or not, has 75 procurement systems. What's a procurement system? Well, if you want to buy a, pa buy a paper clip, you go to your procurement system. It asks you for what charging number you have. It spits out a purchase order. You take the purchase order down to Staples, and you get your paper clips. That's what a procurement system does. The obvious correct answer to how many procurement systems should an enterprise have, the answer is one. Uh, GE has 75. Why is that? Well, it's because they buy, they buy companies who have a procurement system. They sell companies. You know, they, it's like bingo cards. You, you buy and sell things. And most things come with a lot of software. And unless you're willing to stop, spend the time to integrate all of this uh, software into your current systems, you end up running multiple things. So they're running 75 of them. So the GE CFO estimated that he can save $100 million a year if he can just manage to do the following. Now, $100 million, you know, that adds up after a while. That's a fairly big number. So if it can empower each of the 75 procurement officers, when their contract with Staples comes up for renewal, if he or she can figure out the terms and conditions of the negotiated by the other 74 uh, of his or her uh, counterparts, and then demand most favored nation status. So all you have to do is figure out what everybody else negotiated and demand from Staples, you know, fa most favored nation status. $100 million a year. All you have to do is integrate 75 independently constructed supplier databases. And they have like 9 million supplier records. And you've got to figure out which ones are duplicates so that you can figure out which ones are actually staples. $100 million a year, data integration, data cleaning problem. Uh, and enterprises also want to do data integration on parts, customers, lab data, lots of other things. So this is worth a huge amount of money in the enterprise. And it's a mostly a data cleaning and data integration problem. Why is data integration hard? Well, for every local data source that you want to ingest, whether you're the iRobot data scientist or the GE uh, person inside the enterprise, you've got to find the data source. You've got to ingest it, meaning convert it from whatever representation it has now into some common representation. You've got to perform transformations. So if I'm the... If I'm the human, uh, human resources guy in New York, I deal with salaries and dollars. The guy in Paris uh, deals in euros. Uh, I've got to perform data cleaning. A good rule of thumb is that 10% of your data is wrong or missing. And you've got to fix that. Uh, you've got to do schema integration. My wages are your salary, all that stuff. You've got to perform deduplication, which is GE's problem. Find all the, all, the, all the records that actually correspond to staples. And then oftentimes, once you find clusters of records that correspond to the same entity, you want to do, find what are called golden, golden records, golden values, 
which is uh, you want to figure out which address of staples you want to use. If I have uh, two different ages, one of them has got to be wrong, that sort of stuff. So now, so you've got to do all this stuff, and you've got to do it at scale. So GE has about 10 million supplier records in these 75 uh, databases. So do everything on the previous slide at scale. Now you say 10 million doesn't sound too hard. Well, Toyota in Europe turns out to have a distributor in Spain, another distributor in France, another distributor in England, and so forth. So they're doing distribution at the country level with independent entities. So guess what? They all have their own customer database. So if you buy a Toyota in Spain and you move to France, Toyota develops complete amnesia about you. France is a different system. So they are integrating all their customer data in Europe. That turns out to be 250 databases with 30 million customer records in 40 different languages. So at scale, this stuff gets hard just because of scale, not to mention because of the disparity in the data. So don't even think about naive algorithms in Python. At scale, you've got to do this super smart. So how do you do this stuff? Uh, well, traditionally, uh, vendors will sell you uh, extract, transform, and load packages. And on top of that, they will tell you you need master data management, MDM tools. And that's available from the, uh, the usual suspects. And that stuff does not scale. It just does not scale. That will work great on small problems. ETL is used in front of the load for data warehouses all over the world. And if I, I've asked many, many data warehouse administrators, how many data sources are you integrating into your data warehouse? The typical answer is 10. I'll give you 20. Twist my arm hard, I'll give you 50. There's no way this scales to 500, the 250 data sources uh, that Toyota has. So there's too much manual effort. It simply doesn't scale. MDM doesn't scale either. Uh, if I had more time, I would tell you exactly why. But this stuff won't scale. Uh, you can run what are commonly called data preparation tools, trifecta, paxata, you know, elation, dot, dot, dot. Uh, they're very easy to use on small problems. So don't even think about this stuff at scale. If you want to do this at scale, it's a machine learning problem. has to be. Because at scale, you, you can't have man, lots of manual effort. So this overcomes ETL issues. Tamers in this business. Uh, other people are starting to get into the business. This is what you have to do at scale. So I think this is my last slide, and I'm just out of time. What's going to happen in the future? There are lots of data integration startups, some oriented toward data prep, some oriented on sort of scale, some focused on text, some focused on deep learning. There's probably going to be a lot more. This is the Wild West. Hold on to your seatbelt. Expect you know, lots of changes in this space. This is your hardest problem. And hopefully, the commercial vendors will have better and better tools to deal with them. So the summary, machine learning is in your future. Data integration at scale is machine learning. Complex analytics, a lot of that is machine learning. The rest of it is complex linear algebra at scale. So it will be omnipresent. Uh, some of it will be deep learning. There'll be a whole bunch that will be conventional ML. Both of these are, gonna, are going to prosper. You better get smart at this stuff. Uh, complex analytics is going to replace business intelligence for sure. Uh, that is either an ML problem or it's non-SQL complex analytics. 
soon as we can get enough data scientists to do this stuff, and how to support both ML and complex analytics with data systems that have persistence, have versioning, you know, is you know, great problem. But both of these are going to improve a lot over the next few years. But the thing to tattoo on your brain is that both of these are going to get nowhere without clean data. Because without clean data, you're going to produce garbage. My favorite example is a Tamer customer uh, wanted to know how many suppliers do I, how many unique suppliers do I have? And he thought the answer was 3,000. The answer was actually 1,200. Makes a huge difference to the CEO whether it's 1,200 or 3,000. So even on simple analytics, data quality, without data quality, you're nowhere. So this requires data integration at scale. This is your 800-pound gorilla. You should be putting your best people on figuring out a strategy for how you're going to do this uh, with, with a reasonable ROI because it's, it's a lot of very, very hard problems. I'm done. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.